Okay, hello and welcome to your session on neurodegenerative pathomechanics. Uh, it's probably best to begin the session by just defining the word neurodegenerative just for anyone who's not familiar with it. Uh, obviously the neuro refers to neurons, um, the cells of the nervous system and degenerative refers to the continuing breakdown, disruption, and ultimately death of those cells. So any condition that is considered neurodegenerative will present as a condition where cognitive function progressively worsens. Now there are numerous conditions uh, and numerous things you can do which will temporarily blah, blah, temporarily impact your cognition, uh, drinking alcohol, uh, certain medications, recreational drugs, uh, even having a urinary tract infection can cause temporary delirium. Uh, but all of these mental states are temporary and in some cases can leave you feeling a bit worse for wear afterwards. However, in the case of a neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's disease or stroke, for example, or Parkinson's, the condition is progressive uh, and uh, currently not reversible. So that's what we refer to when we refer to neurodegenerative. Okay, so firstly, apologies for the very busy image. It's hard to find a nice image of what I was looking for. Um, this is a sagittal plane view as you can see here in the top left hand corner, hopefully you can see my mouse cursor. Uh, so we've essentially cut through the brain itself between the two hemispheres, removed the right hemisphere and this is our view. Uh, and the only structure we're going to refer to here is the hippocampus. Uh, which is a somewhat sometimes described as being seahorse shaped. I don't really see it myself, but uh, it's this long structure here, or this long portion of the brain wraps around the corpus callosum um, and all the way back again. Obviously, so you have two your hippocampi, one either side. Uh, you may have come across this in. Uh, clinical exercise physiology uh, when referring to exercise and dementia because the hippocampus is a region that is typically first uh, affected or if not first affected uh, presents as the first affected region of the brain in Alzheimer's disease and we can use the model of Alzheimer's disease to understand the role of the nervous system, uh, the higher nervous system I should say, that's basically everything from the brain stem upwards, so the actual brain itself, uh, it's wrong in uh, human movement. Uh, and the reason I emphasize this is for a very long time it was assumed that movement, specifically walking, was considered to be an autonomic process and didn't require any higher cognitive input and when we say higher cognitive input we literally mean higher cognitive input so the autonomic nervous system refers to processes stemming from the brain stem and the spinal cord and uh, there you know things like the heart rate breathing rate uh, it, internal temperature secretion of hormones things like that uh, things you don't have any conscious control of and it was for a long time assumed that once you'd mastered walking uh, as an infant it, it, this wasn't something that required any input from any of these regions of the brain the higher cognitive regions of the brain uh, but this has since been shown to be incorrect um, the motor cortex we know to be uh, a region again I hope you could see my cursor between the frontal lobe in the top left hand corner here and the parietal lobe uh, in a region known as the sensory cortex the sensory cortex uh, does what it says on the tin really um, it's involved with the input uh, 
and decision making of sensory information. So things come in, decisions made, responses sent out. Um, so based on your many, many senses that we have. Um, so the motor cortex sits within this region. Now, the way we first started to theorize that uh, the higher brain had something to do with human gait and specifically walking again um, was the difference in gait pattern in patients with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, it was noted, uh, and this is going back to 1983, but it took a long time for this to become accepted as common knowledge uh, because it's difficult to work with Alzheimer's patients and indeed healthy elderly people, if I'm being honest. Um, but anyway, uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease show an increase in fall risk. Uh, in fact, they're almost three times more likely to fall than an age match non-demented non elderly person. Um, there are a number of possible reasons for this. Um, and again, the, the wrong of the nervous system in human motion could probably form a module in itself. Uh, so we will, this is very much a whistle stop tour of some of the key features. So we know almost intuitively, this has also been demonstrated in the literature, but intuitively that walking requires your attention at certain moments. So uh, particularly if the terrain changes uh, or if an unexpected disruption in the path or direction of traveling occurs. Uh, so attention is a higher cognitive function. Uh, the research also suggests that uh, walking requires elements of executive function and uh, you may have come across this term in uh, psychology uh, but I will do my best to define it if you haven't. It's essentially a collective term, an umbrella term for the various cognitive processes uh, that ultimately create your behavioral patterns. And so there are certain elements of those which are involved in human movement. So just referring back then to the hippocampus, again, we tend to think of this as the area for short-term memory storage. But the brain is immensely complex and I often find it a great irony that your brain is basically what you are. Um, nothing more, nothing less, uh, but we don't really understand it that well. It's one of the most complex structures we know of. Um, but the uh, hippocampus is by no means limited to short-term memory storage. It plays a role in a number of other uh, important functions in the regulation of homeostasis. Most importantly for our discussion, uh, the contribution towards spatial planning and spatial awareness, as well as what is known as the working memory. Again, you may have come across this in psychology possibly, but I like to think of the working memory, perhaps not the most scientific definition, but uh, as your troubleshooting memory, just the the process that gets you through day-to-day -day life when things occur uh, oh need to deal with that okay need to do that need to do this oh this has happened but then those pro the, those events are forgotten or the vast majority of the detail is forgotten um, your working memory is what basically gets you through day-to-day -day life that's what how I like to think of it this takes place in part in the hippocampus along as I say with uh, spatial planning so uh, in the very, very complex process, we won't go through it all, uh, neuromechanism by which we initiate walking, the information is sent to the hippocampus via a series of other pathways and then to the motor cortex. So you can perhaps see where I'm going here. So if there is an issue with the hippocampus, which is the last stop before it, the information gets to the main region it needs to get to to act on whatever's going on. Um, 
if there's a disruption in this area, such as in a condition such as Alzheimer's disease, where we see significant atrophy of the hippocampi, then that's going to have a profound effect on someone's movement pattern. For example, in individuals with Alzheimer's disease, we see the stops walking when talking phenomenon. Um, and this simply refers to the susceptibility to being distracted by external stimuli uh, and therefore the attention on the task that you're being performed being disrupted. And it's a common test which is used as part of a bank of tests. Can someone, uh, or the bank of tests to assess the severity of Alzheimer's disease I should say, uh, can your patient walk and talk at the same time and very often people with Alzheimer's disease can't do both. They can walk but they can talk but they can't do both at the same time because they both require a level of attention that they simply don't have. We would expect to see in someone with dementia uh, would be a shortened step length, reduced gait speed and obviously cadence would come with that as well and an increased step-to-step -step variability so if you refer to the data that you were given for your uh, assessment for this module um, you've got two sets of graphs showing not quite the same thing but similar um, the graphs on the first page you've got show the average for each gait cycle uh, that you performed during the gait analysis. However, you also have the graphs that show each gait cycle uh, that you performed. So I think it was only two or three, I remember off the top of my head. But um, we would expect in young healthy people for each gait cycle to be very similar to the last one. The ankles, knees, hips, shoulders, torso, everything would move in a similar pattern during one gait cycle as it would in the next. Uh, however, in people with Alzheimer's disease, there is greater variability. And we also see a larger sway of the torso from side to side has been reported previously. Uh, so it's an interesting phenomenon nonetheless. Let's move on to the main. I need to stop introducing every slide with so. Um, Let's start by introducing the main theme of our lecture today, and that is stroke. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with what stroke is, but uh, I'll give a brief definition here just for anyone that's unsure. There are two, generally speaking, types of stroke, a ischemic and a hemorrhagic stroke. By far the most common, I think about 80%, is the ischemic stroke. This is caused by an occlusion in a blood vessel within the brain uh, which causes death to any of the neuronal cells which are downstream of that occlusion. Uh, the hemorrhagic stroke is far less common. Um, there's some debate. I've in fact had a disagreement with um, a uh, SHO at, was it, where was it, Zipswitch, um, about whether hemorrhagic stroke is a hemorrhagic stroke or is a aneurysm in the brain. Um, I say stroke, she said aneurysm. I gracefully bowed out eventually. Um, but a hemorrhagic stroke or aneurysm, whichever way you want to look at it, uh, is simply a bursting of the blood vessel in the brain, which again would just cause a redirectioning of the blood and therefore everything that's needed for the cells that are downstream of that blood vessel to survive. So regardless of how you want to classify it doesn't really matter. Um, the outcome is still going to be the same but far less common. Usually associated in people who uh, take recreational drugs so uh, cocaine users are susceptible to hemorrhagic stroke. Also people who lead very stressful lives So a little bit of terminology then before we move forward. Um, in the case of stroke, it usually occurs uh, just on one or within one hemisphere, whether it's a uh, 
uh, ischemic or hemorrhagic. Um, but the hemisphere in which the stroke or lesion has occurred, this, the term lesion is used to refer to what's left if someone survives a stroke, the, the damage that's done, this clump of dead cells and blood and whatever else. Um, the area in which the stroke occurs, be it left or right hemisphere, will affect the opposite limb or the opposite side of the body. So uh, stroke occurring in the left hemisphere would affect the right side of the body. Um, it's not to say that the left hand side doesn't have anything to do with controlling uh, movement and things on the left hand side, but for the sake of simplicity, uh, we'll say uh, left, left hemisphere, right side of the body. Um, and we refer to the affected limb or limbs as the paretic limb. And we refer, refer to the opposite side, usually the side that the stroke has occurred on, as the non paretic limb or the non paretic side. So I've done it again. Uh, a little bit of revision just to set the scene for the rest of our discussion. Uh, just a reminder of our horizontal grain reaction forces, so the anterior, posterior, medial and lateral, and uh, how we tend to think of these during uh, human motion. So recall that your posterior grain reaction force is your braking force, that is the force that you experience when the foot comes into contact with the ground and it slows the body down. It's been said before that walking is just a case of falling from one limb to the other, whereas running is a case of jumping from one limb to the other. Um, the anterior grain reaction force occurs because you are pushing backwards, so it, again, Newton's law, third law of motion, every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. You push down and back, the, the ground is going, I nearly said force plate, the ground is going to push upwards and forwards. So the anterior grain reaction force, represented by this arrow with an A in it, uh, is the, your propulsion force. It's, it's what's moving you horizontally forward. Uh, then, of course, the medial lateral forces. Um, in the case of a healthy adult, uh, this can be associated with pronation and supination. Um, so we initially pronate, uh, sorry, supinate, I should say, when our foot comes into contact with the ground, so we see a small lateral force, then generally pronate throughout the rest of the stance phase. But again, uh, the medial lateral forces are the most variable between individuals. Um, but as we age, the medial lateral forces are become more and more involved in balance and maintaining balance and stability as we move through the gait cycle. The image to the right hand side which shows the inverted pendulum model is just a reminder of the discussion that we had a few weeks ago about step-to-step -step transitions. So recall that the model is not too dissimilar to the roller coaster analogy that I used whereby mechanical effort is required to get the roller coaster cart up to the top of the peak here again hopefully you can see my cursor uh, and then gravity pulls the cart down the roller coaster doesn't physically pull you down there's no mechanism that's pulling you down um, the momentum that is gained from gravity pulling you down can then, in the case of a roller coaster, if the next uh, loop that you have to get through or a peak you have to get over is smaller than the first, can propel you over without any additional mechanical support. In the case of human movement, step-to-step -step transitions refer to the ability to conserve the momentum of the center of mass as we progress from, in this case, the right limb to the left, uh, 
uh, but as you progress from limb to limb and as you transition from one stance limb to another to conserve that momentum that's built up as you are essentially falling towards the next limb and make use of it to help you move up on to the peak of the next arc of the pendulum if that makes sense so this was the first step of someone walking here on the left this would require muscular effort from uh, the gluteus maximus mainly to bring the body up to the midpoint here um, we would then generate a propulsive force from the gastronemus to move us forwards and our center of mass would begin to fall uh, if we walk with good walk economy walking economy then we can conserve the momentum um, and the gluteus maximus has to do less on the second step to bring us up to the next peak of the next gait cycle uh, so just a little refresher there of uh, what we uh, what a economical gait looks like because we need to understand that to understand uh, how neurodegenerative conditions affect the uh, our movement economy so um, on the left hand side here I've tried to graphically represent the results of one study that looked at the difference in the horizontal grand reaction forces in uh, healthy individuals who were in this case right limb dominant Okay, so what they found was that the anterior and posterior grander action forces as they walked were exactly the same. Uh, so too were the lateral grander action forces. The only difference was that at the moment of initiating movement, uh, people with a healthy uh, gait and a healthy, uh, basically, well, basically free of any neurodegenerative condition, showed a greater medial grand reaction force on the non-dominant limb on the left hand side uh, as opposed to the dominant limb um, and this is just theorized to be due to balance so the uh, limb that is left on the ground in the stance phase the non-dominant limb uh, needs to have uh, a slightly better control of uh, the body's position when initiating gait because it's the limb that's required to do so most often. Now this was compared to the right limb dominant and paretic, so the right limb was the limb that was suffering, so suggesting that the stroke occurred on the left hemisphere uh, of stroke patients. So they're still right limb dominant, but the right limb is paretic. Um, and has been affected by the stroke. Uh, now you see a marked difference. There is a significant reduction in the anterior grand reaction force. This isn't to scale, but it does, uh, instead of presenting a boring table, I thought it would be a nicer way to present this data. Um, there is nonetheless a reduction, a significant reduction in the propulsive forces produced when walking. Um, the anterior grand reaction force was even lower in the paretic side compared to the non-paretic side. The medial lateral grand reaction forces were, for want of a better scientific phrase, all over the place, um, very inconsistent, very uh, hard to predict, and this was just a generalisation uh, that was from one particular patient that shows basically larger uh, medial lateral forces, particularly lateral forces on the non-dominant limb and medial grand reaction force on the dominant limb, suggesting more effort required to control balance and there was a much, much, much larger posterior grand reaction force, particularly on the dominant limb. Um, these people weren't participants that were shuffling, but they weren't too far off. Let's put it that way. Uh, so to drag up a good old favourite, our force time 
graph of a normal walking gait cycle. Uh, so you should all be familiar with this. Hopefully I don't need to explain it in any great detail, but this is what a typical healthy person's uh, walking gait trace would look like for a force plate. This is obviously the vertical grain traction force with the two active peaks, the posterior and anterior grain reaction force. So on a force trace, uh, those who had suffered a stroke produced a trace that looked something like this, just a single peak. Um, almost like a scaled down version of a running force trace, you could say. Uh, but in this case, for a very different reason, um, the foot is landing very flat-footed. There is no heel strike, controlled dorsi flexion into mid-stance, plantar flexion. It's just foot down, push forward, or flat foot down, pushing forward to some degree, and foot down again. So it was very much a flat-footed walking gait cycle. Uh, naturally, we would see a significant increase in the posterior grain direction force as opposed to the anterior. And even the duration of time, you notice, is significantly reduced. So the contact time was reduced compared to a normal healthy individual where toe off would occur here uh, in the stroke victim is occurring around about here. Um, only, well, only just, uh, where are we? 40, not even 40% of the gait cycle, um, just over half of the stance phase. Um, so suggesting reduced magnitude of force, increased posterior grain reaction force, and reduced contact time. So heading towards this shuffling style of gait. Now, we can look even further into the kinetic profile of uh, people with neurodegenerative de disease, specifically stroke. This image is taken from, oh, hang on, need to sneeze. <laughs> the image on the right was taken from a study published in 2011, um, and the study was measuring the excursion of the center of pressure now quick reminder on what the center of pressure is if anyone's forgotten it's not something we've discussed in any huge detail i suppose but we have touched on in the past um, if you imagine the vertical grain reaction force the anterior posterior and the medial lateral all overlapping as they would the point at which all three force vectors overlap is considered the center of pressure. It's the point at which the three of them all come into contact. And we can use the center of pressure to assess balance. And balance is determined by your base support, which we have discussed before. Uh, so your base support being the area in which you are in contact with the ground. So if it's just a single foot in this case, then the excursion of the center of pressure would be the point at which the center of pressure started to the point at which it finished. And the distance from the, or not where it finished, sorry, I take that back, to its maximal displacement. Um, I take that back. So uh, the center of pressure movement from its starting point, this final is actually a bit misleading, so I shouldn't have used this. Um, excursion distance is the distance from the initial point to its maximal displacement, so the center of pressure could move around all over the place uh, on the base support, and the furthest point that it travels during a normal gait cycle, or just standing still perhaps, is the excursion distance. Uh, the difference between the area of base support to the maximum displacement of the center of pressure is considered the safety margin. Uh, so if the center of pressure moves over our base support, we obviously fall over as we've discussed before. Uh, so the image that we have on the right hand side here uh, for these are examples from individual patients, one 
two and three. Uh, so one is a healthy individual um, who hasn't suffered a stroke. Two is an individual that suffered a mild stroke. And three, a severe stroke. Uh, so this represents the movement of the center of pressure over repeated gait cycles. So it's not just one line there and back. It's numerous gait cycles there and back. Uh, and down here we have the typical vertical ground reaction force that was produced as a result of this. Now, in the case of mild stroke, we see a slightly more erratic movement of the center of pressure. So you see uh, slightly more medial lateral movement as opposed to mainly just anterior posterior here with the healthy individual. You can see there's this region of medial lateral movement. Um, and a reduced excursion of the center of pressure and a significant increase in the safety margin. The trace, the vertical ground reaction force trace, is starting to look more like what we described in the previous slide. Uh, in the case of severe stroke, we see the center of pressure excursion has increased medium laterally, so if you compare the width of this series of lines to that of a healthy individual, um, but also the length, this is reduced, so increased width, more medium lateral movement, but obviously a dramatic reduction in movement back to forward. So this suggests that the center of pressure is being maintained around the forefoot and midfoot region. There is no, as I said previously, heel strike. This is someone who's landing with a very flat-footed uh, gait. Um, and the safety margin has increased dramatically. Um, and these are two, usually the single peak, uh, but sometimes this pattern that we see here, I don't know if there's a term for this, for the vertical ground reaction force trace associated with severe stroke. Uh, so what this is basically telling us is that with mild and severe stroke, there is a natural proprioceptive protective mechanism coming online that is trying to reduce the risk of falls. Uh, so by reducing the movement of the center of pressure, we are less likely to fall because if it doesn't move around so much, it's less likely to go over the edge of our base support. Uh, however, there is more effort required to maintain this medial lateral movement um, and the uh, proprioceptive function has made an effort to reduce the uh, anterior posterior movement of the center of pressure. Uh, this is all one big effort to try not to fall over because uh, the proprioceptive part of our nervous system is aware that the musculature that surrounds the paretic limb is less likely to be able to control our balance or our, the balance of someone with a stroke um, uh, should they be required to. So this is all a compensatory gait pattern to try and reduce the risk of a fall. Okay, so um, what I had planned to do here was say uh, well, describe what's going on. So first and foremost, uh, we have three gate graphs, which you should all be vaguely familiar with. Um, if you look at the grain line, this is the average for ankle dorsal flexion, plantar flexion, knee flexion extension, hip flexion extension through a normal walking gait cycle. Uh, so we have degrees of flexion or extension on the y-axis and the percentage of the gait cycle here. So the grey line, again, healthy individuals. You should, this should ring a few bells. Uh, the green line represents, uh, well, the green and red lines represent the average of those from this particular study who have suffered a stroke. The green limb or the green line, the green limb, the green line is the paretic limb. The red line is the non-paretic limb. Now, 
the plan here was, and I still encourage you to do so, uh, to pause this lecture and have a go at interpreting what's going on here in these three graphs. What is it that these lines are actually showing you? Remember the green side, green limb is the paretic side, red limb is the non-paretic side, the grey shaded area is the normal comparative group. So perhaps pause here and we will discuss momentarily. <clears throat> ever represent the transition between the stance and the swing phase. So on the paretic limb we notice that the stance uh, the stance limb and swing stance phase and swing phase are almost identical in duration on the paretic side. Uh, whereas on the non-paretic side, the stance phase is over 75% of the gait cycle, and this tiny little period here represents the swing phase on the non-paretic limb. So, why is this? Again, pause. Why do you think that the this gait pattern is the way it is? <coughs> Okay, so the answer is fairly Participants in this particular study are trying to maximize the stance phase on the non paretic limb because that's the healthy limb. Well, healthy, as healthy as it can be. Um, maximize the time that they spend in the stance phase on the uh, non paretic limb and minimize the time that they're in the stance phase on the paretic limb. Um, because obviously that's going to be the weaker limb, that's going to be the limb that is less likely to be able to maintain their balance, posture, so on and so on. Um, so it's a good example of a compensatory gait pattern. Uh, so what are some of the other features we see? Well, let's look at the ankle graph, for, or the ankle sagittal plane graph to begin with. So we on both sides see virtually no and none maybe possible no i don't think so um virtually no uh plantar flexion so as we discussed these are participants that have walked with a very flat-footed style that allows a reasonable amount of dorsal flexion but the lack of plantar flexion suggests a lack of propulsion uh, which is why again we see the reduction in the anterior grand reaction force into plantar flexion on the non paretic side here um, but that just isn't matched on the paretic side simply because it's not possible the joint motion is almost constant actually on the paretic side so too with knee flexion extension um, there's a, a slight peak here and a slight peak here but the overall range of motion so uh, maximum from sort of maximum flexion to extension so in the healthy individual that would be from here to here is reduced so here to here uh, so the overall range of motion is reduced. Uh, looking at the knee flexion on the paretic side, we also see permanent flexion. Um, typically, we start with an almost fully extended limb. Sometimes some people will fully extend their knee. Uh, small amount of flexion, then moving back into extension, flex through the swing phase and then extend the knee ready for the next gait cycle. Um, this is someone who's walking with a almost permanently, well it is a permanently flexed knee on the paretic side. The non-paretic side looks slightly similar to what you would expect. Again, there is a reduced range of motion and a delay in peak knee flexion for reasons we discussed earlier. Um, but again we don't see any 
extension whatsoever. Um, so normally we would see almost a full extension here and here initial contact uh, and at terminal swing uh, which just isn't present and there is a very rigid movement going on here because there is a, is a lack of range of motion uh, the knee is being kept in a fairly locked position uh, the hip follows a very similar trend on both sides in fact so at no occasion does the hip on either side this was taken from I want to say I can't remember I know it was more than 20 participants I can't remember off the top of my head um, but hip flexion on both limbs and I hate to say this and this isn't intended as a joke whatsoever but it's almost a pr well I suppose we are primates but it's a very primate like gait um, where there is just permanent flexion so flexion at the ankle flexion at the knee flexion at the hip that never moves into extension um, but that's perfectly understandable of course so a significant increase in hip flexion here in the paretic side uh, which is never even gets anywhere near full extension um, and again slightly more normalized on the non paretic side but it's having to compensate you see this exaggerated curve here um, to compensate for an exaggerated stance phase um, so th this could if the individual also has conditions like arthritis or any joint problems this gait pattern isn't going to benefit that at all it's going to uh, potentially cause further issues along the line okie doke so oh need to cough <coughs> uh, there are numerous ways of describing our gait pattern and in describing specifically how we recruit specific muscles uh, at discrete moments and intervals in the walking gait cycle and one approach that's been used which helps simplify things I suppose is the modular approach um, now I'm concerned a couple of these might be clipped off um, but hopefully they won't so uh, module one, better explain by doing, oh, they have been, oh, yeah. 